Hi, Dan Stein here with another episode of my Autodesk Forma series, sponsored by Autodesk, a design and make company. In this episode, I'm going to share with you some new functionality Autodesk has added on Embodied Carbon in collaboration with EHDD Architects, based in San Francisco, California. In early February, I was in San Francisco and had the opportunity to meet up with Jack Rusk at their offices and talk about the value that this new tool brings to the industry. This tool is based on a product called Epic that EHDD has made and has a back-end engine called C-Scale, which uses machine learning to help figure out a guesstimated or benchmark or baseline embodied carbon number based on some basic early information on a project. In this particular video today, you'll see a three minute excerpt of that longer interview with Jack, but watch for the full 30 minute interview in the near future. So come on and let's check out these new features together. The thing we've really been focusing on for the last, say, year is actually doing a better job of developing the data model that lives behind Epic and making that data model available to other products and services so that they too can use the same sort of set of insights that are behind Epic mm -hmm. in other parts of design workflows. Epic is useful, but it doesn't have a graphic interface that lets you model a building in 3D. Because it's a standalone web application, it's sort of divorced from other design workflows, mm -hmm. right? It lives sort of siloed in its own sort of space. The database doesn't touch other databases, mostly for privacy reasons. But with that data model, which we call C-Scale, being available generally via uh, a kind of web connection called an API, this helps the insights that you can generate with a tool like Epic mm -hmm. be available to other designers working in other workflows, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that is the core of our collaboration with Autodesk. Like, say, most other architecture firms, in North America, we're very deeply within the Autodesk suite of products. You know, all our buildings are modeled in Revit. This is the workflow we're already in. So the chance to take C-Scale, the data model behind Epic, and put it in the same ecosystem as the rest of the design workflow, to us feels enormously powerful. You're no longer moving from one application interface to another, but you're really living in the same you know, ecosystem of products. And I think our work with Forma is indicative of what you're saying, the sort of goal of Forma is for it to really be in itself an ecosystem where these things can come together. Uh, so we'll be providing the data model behind Epic, C-Scale, uh, you know, within Forma as a native integration to allow embodied carbon analysis of the things being designed. The sort of level of resolution, right, the early phase level of resolution that Epic does really well is something Forma is focused on. And then because Forma is able to talk to the rest of the workflow within Revit and in the rest of the Autodesk suite, there's potential to solve a lot of design workflow questions faced by design teams. Mm -hmm. How do you move from the early phase analysis into the full building LCA, into the bill of materials that then gets right like sent off to the contractor and you have the product specific EPD you can peg to it at that phase. So. Forma with C-Scale, our API within it, is one small part of that workflow, but it's an important part because the decisions you're making at the beginning of the design process will set the trajectory that you have to carry through the rest of the way. Um, and putting that within the same flow of information and data that a project team is already working in is, we think, a natural evolution of our work trying to scale these approaches to climate action in the built environment. In this example, we're going to look at a location in San Antonio, Texas. This building right here happens to be Lake Flato Architects office. And then right here is the Alamo, just a block and a half of the way. So we have this empty site that we're going to create the extrusion of a building on. So the embodied carbon tool only works on native forma geometry. It doesn't work on the geometry created with the Rhino connector or imported geometry from Revit, at least for now. So I'm creating a multi-story building. I just adjusted the floor to floor height to 14 feet. We'll type in 22 stories and then specify the function as commercial. We can see we have a little over 400,000 square feet for the building. 
Next, we need to add the extension. You'll notice if we go to the extension library, we see this embodied carbon tool. It lists EHDD Architects as the collaborator. There's also a link to this information page about the tool. So we'll click Add and Agree. And then once we've added this, it's available in our version of Forma. It's a cloud-based tool, so any computer you use Forma on, you'll have access to this tool now. So first, we'll look at the settings. This is overarching information for this Forma project, the service life of the building and various components within the building. There's a lot of transparency information so that you know what the underlying values are. And you can also turn on interiors and in MEP. They're on by default. Traditionally, those are not included in embodied carbon analyses, but they are good to have and hopefully we'll start using them. So we need to set the program, which is in addition to the function that we already set. And then we also need to set some basic information. So the, the height, the number of stories, the location, all of that's coming from your Forma model. But we need to specify the basic envelope structure interiors options. We're going to give this proposal a name. So I'm calling this one concrete structure with zinc siding. We click run analysis and this hasn't been sped up at all. This happens very quickly. The C scale database that's provided by EHDD is using machine learning to take real world data that's been compiled from various sources and give us this really great predictive baseline or benchmark. So 69 kilograms of CO2 per square foot. Now we're going to duplicate this proposal and make a comparison for the same structure. If we did this structure, the same exact building in steel. And what you'll see here is I, I make a slight mistake and actually accidentally switch back to the concrete proposal. And so I'm changing the structure for this proposal from concrete to steel. So we remember that the square foot number for concrete was 69. And when we change this one to steel and run it again, the difference is 70. So it's interesting, this challenges some of the assumptions that we make sometimes. Uh, the concrete emissions are actually at a zip code level in the United States. So for a building this size, it, you can see everything else being exactly the same. The emissions would be slightly less for concrete versus steel for this size of building in this particular location. Now, another one that we might try is a low embodied carbon goal. Now, this isn't going to be an apples to apples comparison because obviously I'm changing the design a bit, but this also goes to show another thing that you need to be aware of. In this case, we have, we'll have a cast in place concrete structure for the first multiple floors. Maybe this is required because of a code limitation for the overall height of mass timber building. So you can see that the, the original geometry that was copied forward in the proposal still has the default settings. Maybe we want to change the envelope again because this is a low in embodied carbon goal to a different material. Um, and then the other thing to be aware of is technically there's two chunks of building geometry here. One for the base that's concrete and then this top chunk you can see that the None of, there's no settings because this is new geometry, so we need to specify all of these uh, settings. But uh, the thing you need to be aware of is that Forma currently doesn't recognize these two chunks of geometry as a single building. So there may be additional exterior surfaces at the, the top of that base and at the bottom of the top piece. And if two pieces are touching side to side, you know, that it's not really understanding that. 
So you can see that the, the mass timber and concrete hybrid is, is much lower in overall embodied carbon. Notice there is a warning about the multiple pieces of geometry not being recognized as, as a single building. So you can see the scale across the bottom is listing the CO2 values, and then we also had some color coding slight differences on the building itself. So this is just a really brief high-level overview of how we can use this tool to develop a benchmark and then use that benchmark to guide decisions throughout the course of the project to ultimately achieve the lowest possible embodied carbon for that particular project. I'd like to end this video sharing some interesting work that Lake Flato has done in this area on projects. So I actually lead the research program at Lake Flato. It's a program called Investigations where staff can submit projects that they then get to work on over the course of the year with a certain number of hours. They give a presentation and create a white paper like the one you see here. This is a great overview on embodied carbon with case studies that was prepared by Kate Sector and Ryan Yaden at Lake Flato. So it starts out with the overview of what embodied carbon is, the problem it creates, it lists strategies that we take to lower embodied carbon on a project, and then it shares these case studies. So there's a really great example here of several materials being analyzed, basically looking at design options. This is a 10 by 10 wall samples with a 100 year service life. This was analyzed in Tally, which, was, which is an add-in for Revit, originally made by Karen Timberlake now under the building transparency umbrella. And then we also have a great example in here of a, a, a code compliant wall. So here's a best case and a worst case scenario based on how that wall is constructed. And then one of the sample projects or case studies here is a project that I did the embodied carbon analysis for Hotel Magdalena, which is a mass timber boutique hotel in Austin, Texas. The cool thing about that project is it uses DLT for the structural system, doll laminated timber. And then speaking of mass timber, here is a project called Mass Timber End of Life Scenarios by Allison Peets from Lake Flato. It looks at what happens to the structural material at the end of its service life. This is a really great study and we are continuing to develop it in terms of mass timber designed for deconstruction. Here's a great graphic of the A1 through A3 that the Forma tool uses. So as you can see, there's a lot of great new functionality in Autodesk Forma, in particular on Embodied Carbon. It's really great to see Autodesk collaborating with third parties like EHDD, Evolve Labs, TestFit, and more. Stay tuned to this channel for more information on Autodesk Forma in future videos. Thanks for watching.